So, this event this afternoon is the second one in a special series of events, um, which uh, we've, you know, I've given the cheeky name of the Secret Lives of Writers. It's our special focus at this year's festival on writers' archives. Um, now, I think we all know writers' public lives can be very exciting. Uh, their secret lives, their, the, the lives that, that, it, that you can reconstruct from their archives can also be pretty exciting. One reason being that in addition to, to being a, a resource for scholars, for researchers, sometimes the archive becomes a resource for creative people. It's a source of, of inspiration or, or content or ideas or just a, an example to follow. Um, so. Um, I'm going to hand over in a minute to Kai Miller, who is going to tell you a bit more about what's happening this afternoon. Kai is one of the, the two people leading this research project, the Caribbean Literary Heritage Project, along with Alison Donnell. I'm sure many of you are in the audience on Thursday um, for the, their discussion about the, the value of writers' archives. Today we're going to ask about the value of writers' archives in a different sense, because what we've done is, and this is one of the things that I'm very excited about, it's my favorite part of this entire archives project, is that what we've done is we've commissioned three writers sitting here on stage, who you'll, you'll hear the names of shortly, to delve into literary archives that exist here in Trinidad and Tobago, as it happens, um, all of them in the, the uh, special collections at the main library at the University of the West Indies, where there are papers, um, uh, archives and papers from writers like, uh, like Derek Walcott, like Sam Selvan, like Eric Roach, um, like Eric Williams, who was both a politician and a writer. We asked these writers to go and poke around and explore, see what they could find there, and find something that would inspire them to create something new. And we left it pretty open what that new thing could be. So it could be a piece of fiction, it could be a poem, it could be an essay, it could be a something hybrid. Uh, so now we're going to hear what they've come up with. So as I said, I'll leave the detailed introductions to the, the members of the, the, uh, the Archives Project team. I'll hand over to Kai, who's going to be your, your chair and your host for this afternoon. Give them all a big round of applause, and let's sit back and enjoy this. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, uh, does that need to be the right level? Yeah. <clears throat> The tone does sound more dulcet at this. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so yeah, welcome everyone to today. This uh, Nicholas gave a pretty good introduction right there about what this panel will be. I'll tell you a little bit about the project as a whole, the Caribbean Literary Heritage Project, which is really the brainchild of Alison uh, Donnell, who is the kind of powerhouse <clears throat> um, behind it and pushing it along. Uh, it is a pretty ambitious and multi-pronged uh, project, which I guess has at, it, has at its heart uh, the, the job of raising awareness about archives, uh, how, how writers keep archives, how writers keep their own archives, but also uh, the, how, how, the, how we keep our own papers, um, yeah, raising awareness about that, but also thinking about um, archives that exist now and what's hidden there and what we might find there, what we might um, explore and unearth. Uh, <clears throat> so the outputs of the project are, are various. As I said, it's a pretty multi-pronged project. It includes two book projects, one by Alison, who is uh, looking at uh, a kind of long-standing project on women writers who've again been hidden from our uh, the story of West Indian literature. Um, I am looking at some of the early journalists, kind of post-independence, kind of pre-independence, the post-independence um, <clears throat> in the Caribbean. Then we have two PhD students who are kind of uh, very much addendums to those two projects. Uh, Jennifer McDera, who uh, kind of beautifully said that at first she was, uh, she, she thought about how women who migrated, how they were often uh, excluded again from that story of, of the literature. Uh, Jennifer said today she realized being here that women didn't need to migrate to be excluded. Uh, <clears throat> and so her project again is taking on that focus. By the way, I, I, I should say Jennifer is going to be here in Trinidad. A big thing that we've learned uh, doing this project, even in its early stages, is that uh, a lot of what we learn comes from kind of word of mouth. It comes from you guys knowing what we're doing, and you might have a piece of information, you know, oh, you know, I know this journalist, or, you know, my uncle was 
was a writer who did this or who worked at this newspaper. Uh, if you have those stories, tell us. Or my, my great aunt was a poet and you know, no one knew her story or you know, no one's, yeah, please come to us and tell us those stories. We are really, really interested in the, the stories you have, the, the archives you have in your own families and your own stories. Uh, so, so yeah, come to us, tell us. Uh, we'll be happy to look at that. Uh, so I guess the other part of the project um, is we do partnerships like this with Bocas where, as Nicholas introduced, we've uh, commissioned three writers to go into the archives here in Trinidad and to find stories. I think one of the things you will find uh, in these three commissions, which I, I kind of find astonishing because I, as a writer, have been commissioned to write pieces already, and what is shocking, surprising about these three pieces is uh, they are absolutely not phoned in. Uh, they are wonderful pieces of literature that stand on their own, and I think you'll find that um, you are being introduced to three uh, pretty solid Trinidadian talents uh, and you know, three really strong works of um, literature in the making, so um, I'm excited about But um, the PhD students will introduce them, so that's just my plug. Uh, what is the last thing I was going to say? Oh, the last thing I'd say is about our project, the Caribbean Literary Heritage, Pro Heritage Project, please go to our website. Uh, it's full of information. You'll find a lot more there. Um, there's questionnaires. There's the, you know, these little postcards. Uh, please grab one, take one there beautiful book covers on them, you know, uh, and a lot more information. So I will introduce Zakia McKenzie and Jennifer McDera, who will come up, uh, I'm not sure in what order, um, and tell you about the writers on stage, and then we'll, you'll hear from them, and then we'll have a conversation after. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the excellent introduction, Kai. I don't want to take any more time, but to say it's really lovely to be here, and now you know why I'm here. Please find me and tell me the things that you know about women writers. Um, I'm going to be here for a month, probably in January, so I'm going to come back and spend time, but email me if you would like to talk about anything about this project. Um, the first writer that I'm going to introduce is Anu Lacan, and uh, we asked her for more biography, but she doesn't like to say more about herself, so the writing says it, and I'll just give you what I've got on the website. Anu Lacan will write many things and edit everything. She lives in Trinidad with an increasing number of animals who allow her less and less time to fret over food, critical thinking, and definitions of soca. All things that once preoccupied her. Her poetry, short fiction, and book reviews have appeared in Bomb Magazine, Caribbean Beat, the Caribbean Review of Books, SX Salon, Wasafiri, and among others. the bedeviling question of where these things fit. Um, okay, so, no, I got, I'm good. Ah, thank you. Um, I'm just going to get right into the piece. I think um, when we are discussing after, you'll uh, all, all and then change will probably be revealed. Yeah, it actually starts with a sigh. <laughs> Dear Eric, this little is too little. There, there, is that what you wanted to hear? It's, it's not enough, it's never enough. We are not doing this right. The problem is, I am a snow woman. I didn't lie to you, no, not about that, you're not that charming. I'm not from a not Trinidad and Tobago place. My heart does not know changing seasons. I don't want to arbitrarily be grateful to sell and celebrate Thanksgiving just once a year or do any of the other random things that people in not Trinidad and Tobago places do. Nonetheless, I am a snow woman. And you said you didn't want one. I am from that coldest of places. I am from the past. I know walls of ice surrounding my cave and ex-animals on the ground to create the illusion of snugness. I hate when a mammoth dies, but no matter how much I hate the hunt, I let the beautiful creature feed me 
from one never-ending winter to the next. I've tried eating the parts I like least, so I will be unhappy. I've tried eating what I love the most, so it feels sacred. I have tried starving. Nothing works. I know you think this all has something to do with my excuses for not eating vegetables, but I tell you, and I tell you true, that is the least of your troubles. As a snow woman, who has stayed in a rock for a month at a time because I could not dig my way out of the ice, I am not for you. You and our island, as it is now, right now, need some other kind of woman, not one who has, not, who has never seen a green leaf, a day without sun, or a hot ocean. But as you see, I am not what you thought. You must find another. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anu. Hello, everyone. My name is Zakia McKenzie, and I am one of the PhD students on this wonderful Caribbean Literary Heritage Project. And it is my absolute honor to introduce Andre Bagu. Andre is the author of three poetry books, Trick Vessels, 2012, Burn, 2015, and Pitch Lake, 2017. His work has appeared in three his work has appeared in 3AM Magazine, the Asian American Literary Review, the Boston Review, the Cincinnati Review, St. Petersburg Review, and the Poetry Review. He was awarded the Charlotte and Isidore Paiwanski Prize by the Caribbean Writer in 2017 and was specially commended in the 2018 OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature. And to quote from his essay um, regarding this piece here, Andre has said, it goes without saying, Literary connect collections cannot tell us everything. Still, they tell us the things nothing else can. Andre? Thank you. I, I would preface reading this piece by saying, um, I think the question of whether Eric Williams, Trinidad's first prime minister, had a gay relationship with Johnny O'Halloran has been insufficiently assessed. <laughs> the agony and ecstasy of Eric Williams. There were two eclipses of the sun in 1962, both not visible in Great Britain. On the morning of August 31st of that year, the day Trinidad and Tobago gained its independence, he was up at 8.45 a.m., relatively late for him. That night, he smiled. He packed his bags. He penned a letter. Erica, darling, he wrote, just a few lines before I leave for Tobago, to wish you all good luck as a citizen of independent Trinidad and Tobago. I hope you had a wonderful ceremony in London and that you represented me adequately. This is the first letter by the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. See you on Friday next week. Be good, take care, and all love from your Prime Minister Daddy. <laughs> he was a symbolic man. His diary entries before August 31st are in black ink. Then, from Independence Day, everything is red. He was fond of ballet. He loved music. On Boxing Day 1976, he listened to Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, five sonatas, a violin concerto, piano and violin concertos by Tchaikovsky, a piano concerto by Rachmaninoff, and a violin concerto by Mendelssohn. The second to last entry in his diary was a note of an expense. He paid $260 for the purchase of speakers. His hearing aid cost US $400. His spectacles, $187. In 1981, he met with Patrick Manning on January 12th, February 6th, 
February 20th, February 23rd, February 24th. People say he disliked Manning. On September the 2nd, 1976, at 1.45 p.m., he met officials of the Federal Republic of Germany, the government of Belgium, the government of Venezuela, and USSR government representatives who happened to be in Tobago. In that year, he wrote in a black German-made diary that had Prime Minister on the cover. 1976 was the year Trinidad and Tobago declared itself a republic, but he made more entries in his diary about a man named Johnny O'Halloran. January 17th, drugs, O'Halloran, $100. February 10th, drugs, O'Halloran, $100. February 23rd, drugs, O'Halloran, $40. March 29th, drugs, O'Halloran, $145. April 28th, drugs, O'Halloran, $107. June 4th, drugs, O'Halloran, $100. June 10th, drugs, O'Halloran, $25. July 12th, drugs, O'Halloran, $100. July 13th, Drugs, O'Halloran, $93. November 4th, Drugs, O'Halloran, $214. December 1st, Drugs, O'Halloran, $222. According to reports, Johnny had a beautiful voice and beautiful large brown eyes. Johnny wore only white or cream-colored suits, drove large American cars, had Irish charm, I've never done anything wrong in my life except fight cocks and love women, Johnny once said. Many have made similar claims before. <laughs> Johnny was a drug. Eric was his big daddy. He put him in cabinet. He fought for him. He made him executor of his will. Nothing could cure what they had. On November 11, 1976, after paying Johnny $214 for drugs, Eric underwent an electrocardiogram. Something was happening to his heart. Or something was happening to his mind. In 1991, doctors in Japan discovered that you can die from a broken heart. He had many doctors. Dr. Bartholomew, Dr. Aki, Dr. Lee, Dr. McShine, Dr. Joseph, Dr. Wyke, Dr. Ince, and some Japanese doctor, according to one source. But no doctor ever discovered the cause of his greatest torment. No doctor found out why he was deaf. It was perhaps deafness that led to his passion for music that heightened all his other senses, touch, smell, taste, that protected him from what others had to say, that gave him the written word. On February 13, 1976, he spent $230 on groceries and finished reading The Dying of the Light by Professor Arnold Rogau. He spent $100 on cosmetics and drugs on March 10th, 1976. He donated $60 to church collection and saw Johnny at the end of day. On September 11th, 1976, he noted there was a violent shower. He spent $20 on laundry on October 6th. On January 15th, 1981, the year of his death, he bought $862.83 in flowers. The next day, he had cabinet. On January 28, 1981, he spent two hours cleaning the louvers of the empty bedrooms in the Prime Minister's residence. On the final Valentine's Day of his life, he was up at 7.15 a.m., spent the day annotating a publication called Rebellion, Revolution, and Armed Force, 
and read a Harvard energy study, among other things. He spent $100 on Valentine, $72 on milk. As a child, milk had been a luxury. He spent $255 on meat on March 17, 1981, and $5 on the dog. His last haircut cost $10. The last entry in his diary was made seven days before he died. He noted a final expense, insurance, $320. The premier closed the diary as if he had secreted the remaining ounce of his soul in black ink he had dropped the red soon after independence. The diary's paper lined and divided into boxes, his life now chaptered and dog-eared, his passions prorogued by the thought of who was coming for him. Days passed in which he wore the same soiled clothes and wrote no more. Then, on the last Sunday, he blasted all the records and sat alone, imagining the moment when he fell as a child on the football field and the world was just an empty stage and all he could hear was the symphony of a life he had not yet lived. Thank you, Andrew. I think one of the best things about coming here for Zakia and I is meeting a load of other archivist geeks. So we're just hearing people really excited to get their hands on papers and other people's details. And uh, Anu said, I have a great passion for the dead. They are so exquisitely far away, which I think is lovely to think about in light of her piece. Um, the next writer and the final writer today, thank you, is Brianne McIver. Uh, she's a Trin Trinidadian author who co-founded People's Republic of Writing, a populist group created out of the belief that writing belongs to everyone. She's been shortlisted for writing prizes, including the Derek Walcott Writing Prize in 2005 and the Fish One Page Prize in 2010. In 2015, her story, Christoph and Bonnie, won the Caribbean writer's David Hoff Literary Prize. Her work has appeared in Origami Journal, Rock Bottom Journal, Akashic Books, Duppy Thursday series, and elsewhere. And I just wanted to share with you something that she said in the blog that she wrote on our website so that you have a bit of context for the kind of work that she's been doing. Uh, and having done some literary archive work in the UK, she came and started working in UWI and she said, the experience was revelatory. It showed me that I'd got used to research light, getting my information through listicles like click here to read about the 10 most reclusive writers. And we've just been talking before this session about how you look in research and how you look in archives and when you haven't got a hyperlink to tell you what to do next and you're just sitting there and making the sorts of decisions that people have made before you about what to collate and it's just a whole interesting world to be in and I'm really looking forward to all of us being in here together. So, Brianne McIver. Thank you very much. Um, I did catch archive fever, so much so that I wrote something much too long to read in its entirety. So this is an extract. Becoming Bianca Black. 14th of Jan. Page one of what is to be a very illustrious literary journal. Why have you succumbed to this self-interview? For the money. Okay, really? For the conversation. For the record. To remind myself that although I spent yesterday near naked, being slathered with chocolate syrup and squirted with whipped cream for a Valentine's Day photo shoot, I'm not some dumb model. It's easy to forget that when a photographer is yelling at you to arch your back and pull your panties lower, and the combined actions cause that 
awful sticky syrup to run into your body's cracks and crevices. And when you go home, even after using the most aggressive body scrub, you still can't get the smell of Hershey's syrup off you. And when you work as a model, it's easy to forget that you're a thinking, remembering mind and not an amalgamation of statistics. 32A boobs, 26 inch waist, 34 inch hips. So here I am, writing to remind myself that I am Bianca Black, daughter of Bonnie Black, born in 1993 in St. Clair's nursing center, published in seven literary journals thus far, soon to be author of A Life in Three Loves, the working title of my magnum opus, or really my only opus, since I've never written a collection before. That's who I really am. So Bianca, setting's been established. Write something. Something. Something so that when this journal is in the archives of the University of the West Indies and you're the Booker Prize winning, Orange Prize winning, Nobel Prize in Literature winning, first female Trinidadian author to be granted the honor, that something will make scholars say, yes, she was brilliant all along. She was the kind of author who showed the world as it was. Write something. But I can't. All I can think of is how to work my angles, swivel my hips while sucking in my stomach, cross my right leg over my left to hide the scars on my knee. I am being stupidified. Modeling is erasing the parts of my brain that used to be able to quote Shakespeare and Austin and Walcott. Instead, I have images of Victoria's Secret Angels and itty bitty thongs that have replaced these authors as my research. I keep a list of every book I've ever read for the past six years. Six years ago, I read five books a month with highlights including Anna Karenina, The Old Man and the Sea, A House for Mr. Biswas, and The Autumn of the Patriarch. And now, the Fat Flush Cookbook. Skinny bitch in the kitchen. Kick ass recipes for hungry girls who want to stop cooking crap and start looking hot. Both real books. Google them. <laughs> so, this is my promise to myself, to whoever reads this journal when these days are far behind me. I am going to write something smart. I'm going to keep myself sane, and I'm going to give up modeling soon. 15th of Jan, self-interview session number two, in which the author attempts intelligent conversation. What are your thoughts on the way Marquez manipulates time in the autumn of the patriarch? Well, Bianca. I found the novel a near unreadable stain on Marquez's reputation, and it's a miracle that it got past not just his editor, but an entire publishing house and a translator to find its way into print. It's a credit to my tenacity as a reader that I was able to complete it. What are your thoughts on the way Reese portrays colonialism in Wide Sargasso Sea? Brilliant. Who are your literary inspirations? Edwidge Danticat and Derek Walcott. 16th of Jan, self-interview session number three. When did you stop being an interesting person? I don't know. I used to feel as if I had so much to say and no one to talk to. I guess the situation has markedly improved in that now I have nothing to say and no one to talk to. So at least my brilliance is not being wasted on account of it no longer existing. Self-interview session number four. How long will you keep up the pretense of this interview? Not one word longer. 
1st of Feb. Yes, I'm back. But only because I finally have something to say. Today, I met Obadiah Cortland. I know. That's a name that sounds as if his mother picked it off a most pretentious baby names of all time list. And dear reader, Mr. Cortland was so offended that I didn't know who he was that he stormed off. But only after insulting me first. He was dressed from head to toe like somebody. Black shirt with one too many buttons undone. Black pants. Red and black striped socks. Black shoes polished a painful shine. Red handkerchief tied around one wrist. Aggressively tussled hair, like his stylist was also into S&M. And a ludicrous eyebrow piercing with two black stones glittering on either side of an obviously shaped brow. I was doing a classy shoot. No chocolate syrup hair. I was in a sparkling ball gown, draped over the back of a chair as if I were a piece of cloth. That was the photographer's vision. Mr. Cortland walked right up to me. How much do you weigh? He asked. No hello. No excuse me. I picked myself up from the chair and carefully adjusted the dress. What kind of a question is that? I asked, because what kind of a question is it? Carmichael, he called to the photographer. Give me her stats, height and weight. Who the hell are you? I demanded. My dear, I am Obadiah Cortland, he said, witheringly. I turned to the poor photographer. Is that supposed to mean something? Carmichael turned the color of a piece of steamed fish. Mr. Cortland, he stammered. She's five feet, 11 inches tall, and she weighs, shut up, Carmichael. I don't know why I copied Mr. Cortland and called him Carmichael. I'd always call him Daniel. If you want to know how much I weigh, you can ask me nicely. Otherwise, you can go to hell, I said. Well, he said, producing a pair of reflective aviator shades from his pocket, I guess I'll go to hell. And he did, presumably. It took Carmichael 10 minutes to recover. Do you know who that is? He demanded. Who is he? So he told me, local makeup guru, owner of the only international makeup school in Trinidad, worked on stars as diverse as Halle Berry and Barbara Streisand. Close links to Miss Universe, publishes a magazine that launched the careers of every Caribbean model who'd ever made it anywhere. Well, Carmichael, I said, it's a good thing I have no ambition to be a Caribbean model making it anywhere. I'm just doing this for now. Carmichael gave me a look that said, yeah, right. And I went back to draping myself over the chair. Third of Feb, in which the author receives an unpleasant delivery. It was the last day of the shoot. We were all the way at Las Cuevas Beach, not one cloud in the sky. Carmichael, I somehow can't think of him as Daniel anymore, had draped a white sheet over the sand and I was wearing a wedding dress. Lying back on the sheet, I made sure to press my shoulders into the earth, arch my stomach up and away, tuck my ass and let my knees fall together like I was a little rag doll or a little girl who needs the help of a big, strong man to pull her up. Then I threw my head back and parted my lips. It's the kind of can sexiness that sells. Carmichael was saying those things photographers say. Give it to me, Bianca, and yes, baby. Then a man in a red and gray FedEx uniform showed up. He had an envelope addressed to me. There was no signature, no letterhead, nothing like that. 
just two words, 128 pounds. The bastard. 5th of Feb, in which the author actually discusses writing. Spent today working on my magnum opus. Can't be a great writer if you don't write. I sat down and put on my favorite YouTube playlist, harp music. What I really want to do is tell my mother's story. I have a Hallmark card I bought to inspire me. It's stuck to the wall in front of my laptop. The front shows a red heart tucked into an envelope. It reads, Mom, I love being your daughter. That's what I want my stories to say. If my mom were alive, I imagine that I would give her a card like that. My favorite Edward Dante cat is the Dew Breaker, which tells the story of her father, a man disfigured by a rope-like scar who lived a life like a giant with boots on either side of Haiti. My mother wasn't like that. She lived an unexceptional life by the standards of the world. She was born to poor parents. She dragged herself out of it by marrying up, but still. She had me. She got sick. She died when I was 16. But I think we need to tell these stories too. She built my life with careful blocks, books, good manners, knowing how to sit and eat at a table, knowing how to dance to both soca and to a waltz, knowing how to swim, knowing how to eat healthy, and when I was old enough, knowing how to cuss, how to stand up for myself, so that when someone decided to cut the line in the grocery, or cut me off in the road, or push in front of me, and good manners didn't work, I could tell him to move his mother so-and-so before I move him. I want my stories to catch my mother at different times in her life. When we knew she would die, we would stay up late, drinking tea, and she would tell me all the stories about her life. She would say things like, I was going to tell you this when you were 18, but now. She would tell me that she'd read my books from heaven. She doesn't have that much to read so far. I wonder what she thinks of my modeling photos. I heard some men in the gym talking about one of the photo shoots I did. The magazines were available for free at the front desk, and the men had a copy spread out between them. I had on red, red lipstick and coal darkening the rims of my eyes. The theme was avian. I was topless, with two red feathers arching over my breast, just covering my nipples. In reality, they had to Photoshop the stray parts of the areola out. You know this is Dominic Chankit's daughter? One of the men was saying, whoo! Another one said, I wonder what he thinks seeing his little girl like this. And they laughed about it. In another world, they would be saying, do you know this is Bonnie Black's daughter? Do you know that Bonnie is such a lion that her daughter has her last name? I don't know what my father thinks of the pictures, but I don't think my mother would have minded. Sixth of Feb, in which an invitation is delivered. I never have visitors, so when someone knocked on my apartment door, I was immediately suspicious. I'd seen warnings about thieves who dress up like they work for one of the phone companies and ask you to let them in to check their landline before they rob you. I wish I lived in one of those apartments with a people so you can see who's outside before opening up. I did the next best thing. Who is it? I shouted through the door. FedEx, the man shouted back. FedEx? I wondered whether the thieves had gotten hold of FedEx costumes too. Then I remembered Obadiah Cortland's delivery on the beach. Can I help you? I asked, swinging the door open. I had to sign for the envelope. Dear Miss Black, I would like to request that you enjoy the pleasure of my company over tea at Lorelei's Tea Shop on 7th of February at 3 p.m. 
I do hope you will allow me to grace you with my presence. Yours sincerely, Obadiah Cortland, Mr. I know what you're wondering. And yes, of course I'm going to go. At the very least, he's going to offer me a job. And I could always use the money. Thank you. Here. Okay. Uh, I guess the obvious question. Um, I, I, I gather that uh, uh, that where you started uh, looking into the archive is not necessarily where you ended. And archives are always, um, I mean, they're they're windy, kind of serpentine things. So, can you just tell us briefly where did you start and where did you end up uh, for each of you? So. So I. Um well, I've always been fascinated by the figure of Eric Williams. I don't think there's anybody who isn't. Um, but um, I began with, um, I actually went to the Heritage Library here at Nallis, and um, I examined various collections that they had. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I decided I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And the approach I basically adopted was I felt my way through the archives. So I just looked at loads of different collections and different items. And then I came back to Eric Williams, mm. and I was like, I'll stick with this. Yeah. So I wasn't too sure where to begin. I actually began with Andre looking at Eric Williams' diaries and sort of worked my way through various authors. Um, I was actually pretty apprehensive about looking at Derek Walker just because his archives are humongous and you almost don't know where to start. So I saw something called sort of Black Journal. I'm like, I'll start there. And he actually conducts a self-interview that I borrowed the first line from, which is why have you succumbed to this self-interview? And he answers for the money, um, which is one of the only similarities between sort of what he wrote, which is kind of very detailed intellectual discussion of colonialism and tourism being a superior form of prostitution in this. But that's sort of what inspired me here. Um, so my Eric is a different Eric. It's the Tobagonian poet Eric Roach, about whom uh, far too little is known um, and basically people who know anything about Eric Roach, which, which might be a reasonable number of people, uh, they know two things. They know that he killed himself, and they know a poem called I Am the Archipelago. Um, I went straight for my Eric, because um, I knew that's who I wanted to talk to, because um, I feel like we've been in dialogue for a while. Um, and my piece, Kai, actually was quite at the beginning Mm. Uh, the first folder, folder 15, I think, uh, box two. Um, and it's, a, I believe, an unpublished uh, work of fiction. Mm -hmm. And he references a snow woman, um, which means something completely different from what the snow woman I've written about means. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll ask a quick and weird question. Uh, but I guess I've always wondered about that... How does the imagination interact with the archive? Uh, you know, this thing that seems fixed, what happens when you apply imagination to it? Uh, I, I remember this, the Scottish writer Janice Galloway once told me about researching a story for years and years and years and building it up. Uh, and she could never write the story because there was always more research to do. And then there was a fire and it destroyed about 12 years worth of research. And she finally got to write the novel. And in that way, the archive almost held back creativity. And yet here we are talking about archives leading to creativity. So what is it, what, what has your approach been, that weird, tortured interaction of imagination and archive? One of the things I began to think about um, doing this was how language itself is inherently an archive. 
And um, the question that we're often asked in this project is, has it made us think differently about our own papers and will we be preserving stuff? And uh, I was thinking how, um, especially for a poet, uh, each word is itself an archive because it contains a kind of a memory and an association. So in a sense, uh, the process of writing and the process of poetry is it, it, it's an inherently archival. Um, it's a kind mm. of um, uh, intonation of something from the past with a, an authoritative stamp and form. And so that's how I was kind of interacting mm. with the archive creatively. Right. So even after I'd had my idea of what I wanted to do, I kept returning to the archives to read more of Derek Walcott's archive works and some of the poems that he'd changed. And there was one day I was actually supposed to go up and I sent an email to say, sorry, I won't be able to make it. And I just went and sat down instead in a coffee shop and just started writing. And I think that for me, you get that inspiration, but then you need to sort of make a break and force yourself to go through your own creative process. Because if, at least for me, you're perpetually in the habit of sort of comparing what you've done to Derek Walcott, it won't be good enough. Um, there's always something better. So you had to say, all right, I've got my jumping off point, and now I've got to, to work on my own. Um, I agree with the idea that archives can be just, uh, just hopelessly intimidating. Yeah. Um, there's a, well, a, a little bit of good fortune on my part. There's very little about Eric Roach. Um, if I were doing an, inter an academic exercise, I think there would have been no stopping. I would have had to go to Tobago. I would have had to drive, uh, I would have driven from Jasper Avenue to Quinham Bay. Um, you know, it just, it, there would never be enough, to, uh, enough research material until a building burnt down and stopped me from doing it. With a creative process, I found that you have to have a limit for yourself. You have to know when you've had enough and when something is going to start hurting the work itself. I'm inherently suspicious of inspiration. Um, I'm, I'm a very plodding person, and I believe in, in sort of research and hard work and sticking with it. Yeah. And I knew quite early on, even though I'd written three drafts of other things, other ways in which I could have spoken to Eric Roach, um, this thing about the snow woman had stuck with me, and it had caught hold uh, quite happily on the page and wouldn't go away. And so creating her and her relationship just became an exercise of finding out who she was, what she wanted, what she didn't want, and what she had to say. Well, let's talk about those limits. And I, we are almost out of time already. So I am going to ask one more one small question about limits, about the extent of this project. I, I know your project has gone on even further and you've, you've, ex, you've imagined it as a whole nother. Do you see, do, do you other two see yourself moving on with your exploration of Eric Roach or Eric Williams of the Erics in, in any way beyond this? I mean, no judgment if you don't. Could you just yes or no? Well, it's definitely, um, and um, I, I couldn't read them um, because they were not readable. Uh, the, um, the poem yeah. has, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, literally, the poem has three of the po <laughs> no, they're not rude. The, the poem has three, three appendices, <laughs> which are um, visual poems and concrete poems, uh, and, and um, they kind of play with this notion of, um, uh, of academia and that type of writing but in a very wild kind of way. So I take one, I take one of his book covers, Inward Hunger, and I do mm. something visually with it. And I mean, that exploration already, you know, has got me thinking about, uh, for instance, the transgression between uh, moving from a kind of a traditional lyric to this prose-like tone. Because you've done concrete anuses already. Sorry? You've done concrete anuses already. I ha well, yeah. <laughs> He's referring to an, uh, an, an, inf an infamous poem of mine. <laughs> That's <not> clearly <laughs> <laughs> um, But um, uh, you can read it in Pitch Lake if you want to know more. But, um, but no, I mean, yeah. the idea of transgressing uh, media yeah. uh, is fascinating to me. And, and the way in which this could actually 
rove a course moving from the written word to the visual to maybe other things like movement and even conceptual processes because okay. I, I've been like for instance um, recently this group uh, is it forensic architecture they were nominated for the Turner Prize mm -hmm. and what they do is they investigate um, they actually do investigations but it becomes uh, art mm -hmm. I mean, and that raises a lot of questions about well what is the material of art uh, and what is the difference between art and life yeah. and so um, yeah I definitely see this as becoming much wider. Yeah. And finally, Adam. Um, well, I know that we are short on time. It seems to be the theme of anything I'm involved in. Um, so I'll tell you just what the, the three other drafts were, mm. were like, and hopefully just those titles will give you something to make you want to read about Eric Roach. Um, one is, um, I too am a recovering federationist. Um, <laughs> The other one is, yes, Eric, me too. Um, <laughs> and the third one is, um, oh dear. Okay, maybe there's not a third one. Maybe the snow woman is a third one. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to continue to engage with yeah. the work um, and the sort of where I kind of always saw my place um, in this group is that I'd been working with archives for a long time and generating um, creative products out of it um, because as, as per my introduction, I'm really comfortable with people who aren't here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, guys, I, I would have loved to have given the audience a chance to ask a question, but I think that would be a little bit rude and there's a session right after this. So forgive me, I, I, I really don't want to uh, go over time and push bookers. But uh, Nicholas would like to say. Yeah. But yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you for coming, for engaging. And again, if you have any bits of knowledge, anything you know about that, would, that can uh, fuel our project, or, you know, just little scraps of information, throw them our way. Uh, we are hungry and happy for them. Uh, but thank you for coming out and thank you for listening to the three commissioned works. Uh, cheers. <laughs>